Good afternoon, ladies and gents. It's Simon Brown here. Today, really, we're looking at uh, investing internationally, a number of issues around that. Uh, we're going to go from the simple to the slightly less simple. As always, we will take questions towards the end of the webinar. If you've got them during the event, you can just pop them in the uh, question box at the bottom of the application, and we will get to the questions at the end. Fairly short, fairly simple. Uh, I suppose the first point is why to go international. I don't want to delve too much into this. I'd like to start a webinar with the whys and what's. And, um, a couple of reasons. Our market is small, 400 shares. doesn't give a, a huge amount of scope. And there's a lot of sectors and industries which we simply don't have um, able to invest in. Global companies, we, JC's got a number, so I'll delve into that, but you know, the big ones, uh, Amex, Coca-Cola, Glasgow Klein, Smith and the like, um, we've got uh, maybe a dozen or so, a couple of dozen truly global companies. Uh, globally, there are hundreds, if not thousands. And I mean, if you look at the size of the JSC, as I said, 400 shares. If we look at the size of, of international markets, um, New York Stock Exchange alone is over 2,000. In fact, there's a an index in America, the Russell 2000, one index, 2,000 shares. Uh, different economic conditions, and what I mean by this is we're in emerging market. Maybe you want to get away from emerging markets. Maybe you want to get more pure emerging markets. Maybe you want to go east into, into Asia and the like. I know a lot of people want to invest into China. That is immensely difficult and typically needs to be done via managed funds of a sort. Um, certainly not easy, but a way to spread that, 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 that economic conditions uh, you know, if you were living in Greece for right now, you'd certainly want to be investing somewhere else, I suspect. How do we do it? There are actually a fair bunch of ways. Uh, JC listed multinational companies. I'm going to go into each of these in a bit of detail, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it now. We've got some international ETS we can invest in. We've got the International Derivative Futures, IDX, uh, and then, of course, Direct. Whether it's opening an account with a New York or a London or a Sydney or whichever stockbroker um, in that case there. And we'll go into each of those. The multinationals, companies that are earning most of their income outside South Africa but are listed on the JSC. And there's actually a lot of those. Um, most times dual listed. And a bulletin, for example, listed Sydney, London, and South Africa, uh, in part a South African company. But the point is, is that the vast majority of their income is coming offshore. Richmond earns hardly any of their income in South Africa. They really are an international company. Um, SAB Miller, very much emerging market focus with a, a large slice in America. Again, they traditionally were a South African company and they started in South Africa, but now also listed in London and, and certainly the majority of their income coming internationally. So there's a lot of them. We can, in rands and cents, on the JSC via our current brokerage account, get this exposure, um, but I, I, I'm thinking people wanting perhaps pure exposure, and certainly that's what I'm going to look at uh, in the next couple of slides coming up. We've got some international ETS, exchange traded funds. They are issued by Deutsche Bank, um, five of them in total. What's nice about them is they trade on the JSC in rands, and as it says down at the bottom there, it's not in any way part of your offshore allowance. That I think offshore allowance is a correct four million per person per year. It's not part of that. It's a nice and easy way to do it. And there are five. Uh, namely, there's the J Japanese one, there's one in the UK, one that covers the US, one that covers Europe, and then a global one at the same time. And what they do, let's look at the, uh, the UK one. The UK one tracks the FTSE 100. So when you buy the DBX UK, you buy in the Deutsche Bank uh, ETF issued over the UK, you're getting pure exposure to those 100 shares in the UK. And you get it in pounds. You give Deutsche Bank the rands when you do the transaction. They convert them into pounds. So you go and get yourself that exposure in pounds on the UK to the top 100. They're a great product if you're looking particularly for a territorial advantage in a sense. Of course, if you're looking, you don't want to buy the UK, you actually want to go and buy BP, but well, then they're not perhaps so great. So it depends how you want in that, that international exposure. Uh, as always, an ETF, um, in this case, there's, so there's market makers, you get all of those protection around them. You can buy them uh, direct from DB. You go to xtrackers.co.za, um, which is their name. So a nice product, but again, perhaps not quite fitting what everyone's looking for 
when they're looking for that international exposure. IDX, newish product, uh, probably came out a year or a year and a half ago. Essentially, they are futures listed on international companies that trade internationally. Companies like Berkshire Hathaway, companies like General Electric, uh, there was General Motors, no sorry, there wasn't General Motors, um, Gasco Klein Smith, Coca-Cola, American Express and the like. Trade on suffix and they operate, they are a pure future. So if you take 100,000 Rand exposure, there is a margin requirement which would be eight or 10,000 Rand. So you get that gearing effect. So you, you're, you're not trading the share you, you are, but you're trading it via a future. So you are taking very much a futures position. And importantly, not all suffix brokers offer them. In fact, a lot of suffix brokers don't offer access to them. Um, if, you, if you're looking for a broker who does contact the JSC, uh, they can certainly provide a list. Well, check with your broker. Uh, I know my broker doesn't uh, offer them at all. I know it's in development, but not yet available in that space there. Perhaps the, the issue with them, uh, some very wide spreads. The difference between the buy and sell prices uh, can be quite hectic. Um, obviously, they're geared, so that's also an issue. And trading times. The moment the U.S. is opening at 3.30, uh, later in the year during our summer, it will open at 4.30 our time. And, of course, they're not making a market because there are market makers, in other words, buyers and sellers in that space. Uh, I think the important point there is learn and understand before you trade them. And I, I think it's very much a case of that they are more of a trading instrument than anything else. I, Christo is asking if IDX is really an investment option um, as it's a future. Short answer, no. It is very much a trading option rather than investing. I know some folks who kind of use it for trading. And, and what I mean by that, you want to buy 100,000 Rand of Rio Tinto. They only request a 10,000 Rand deposit, your margin, but you put the full 100,000 into the account. Uh, so that you, you, in essence, put the full deposit down. You're earning some interest on that money that's sitting there, the extra 90000 But it's a bit of a hack. In truth, they, they really are a, a trading more than investing. If you're going to invest with them, you're very much uh, hacking the process. And then I think the point which, which is, is probably what people are more interested in is how do we directly open a, a, an account with the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, uh, FTSE, whatever the case may be, um, there's a lot of red tape up front, and, and when I say a lot, I mean it's there. The red tape is one off. You know, often with red tape, when you've done it, it's done. Now it's all there. The first point you've got to do is you've got to get a SARS clearance certificate, and that basically is SARS saying that your tax affairs are up to date. In other words, you don't owe the money, you haven't got any returns, there are no disputes. You go to your local SARS office, you request a clearance certificate, and typically they would issue it within about 48 hours. Certainly, I've got them with a very, very quick turnaround. Now you've got a SARS clearance certificate. That now says that you have permission to take your money offshore. So you can now physically take your money offshore. Um, then you need to look at an offshore bank account. In some cases, you will be able to do a direct transfer from a local bank into your broker internationally. Uh, some banks aren't happy with that, um, and some of the brokers aren't particularly happy with that, and certainly there's uh, some onerous fees involved in that process. So look at the idea. Perhaps you want to set, off a, uh, set up an offshore bank account. You've got your SARS clearing certificate, so that wouldn't be a problem. If it is with your existing bank, there shouldn't need to be FICA. Obviously, if it's another bank, it would be FICA. And if it's an international bank, say you went for HSBC as an example, you would need to do their FICA requirements. So again, a little bit more red tape. I suppose the big question is, do you need to? And if you don't, do you perhaps want an international bank account? You then got to go and find yourself an international stockbroker. I'll touch on those in a little more detail in a slide or two, uh, that international stockbroker. And it's going to be probably territory specific to a fair degree. Some of them are global, but many of them it's a case of if you're going to go into the US, you would look for someone like maybe Charles Schwab. If you want to go into the UK, maybe it's E-Trade. If you want to go into Australia, maybe it's Comsec. Um, Saxo Bank typically enable uh, transactions across multiple exchanges, um, but there's also some regulatory and red tape issues around that. But you obviously need to go and find that international stockbroker, and you would need to do FICA. All different territories have FICA requirements. It's not just South Africa. You would need to go and do that FICA, uh, supply the documents. It's not onerous. Uh, typically, I courier it, 100 or so around to courier the FICA across to them, and they get it. You know, the, 
a day or three uh, process it. Certainly when I've opened international accounts, it hasn't been a particularly painful experience beyond the fact that there's a lot of initial red tape and paperwork to do. International brokers, I mean, what are you looking for? Again, it's issues around costs. Typically, your international brokers are very, very cheap. I mean, in the U.S., you typically pay a flat fee for a trade, uh, usually somewhere between, uh, sometimes as low as 7 but usually about 10 to $15 per trade, regardless of trade size. Um, what sort of research are they giving? Charles Schwab has very, very good research. I, I can't comment on the others. Charles Schwab is the one example I have used. They have very good research, both on the companies as well as economic research. Um, tools that are available, um, and, and again, I mean, we, we've got top uh, stockbrokers in South Africa in the online space. Absolutely, we have. I mean, we typically, when we go to the U.S., we're going to find the real bells and whistles, and this is because they are the market leaders in that space. Uh, the U.K. to a slightly lesser degree, Australia perhaps even a slightly lesser lesser degree, but we're going to find a lot of tools, a lot of bells and whistles. Uh, are there minimum amounts? Uh, check that. I know some of the local brokers, which I'll touch on in a moment, um, transactions have to be a minimum of 10,000 US dollars. Some of the international brokers want an, a minimum deposit uh, or a minimum trade size. The big ones that I will mention in the next slide certainly don't, but check that before you go and do all that red tape and all of that complicated work. Uh, are they advisory? Now, advice is different from research. Research is where they will publish research and put it out there. Advisory is more where they will help you construct a portfolio. They will, you know, if you want to buy Coca-Cola, they would say no, rather buy Pepsi for this reason or that reason. As always with advice, the real question is how good is it? You need to check that. And then what markets do they offer? Now, are they just offering a single territory? Also in the US, remember that there's many markets. There's New York, there's NASDAQ, there's also the uh, New York Mercantile Exchange, there's the Chicago Board of Options. Now typically if you go to a US broker, they will offer all of the different US markets. Now the question is, do they offer you access into the international markets, into London, into Europe? Maybe you want to trade on the DAX in Germany or the, the Kakaron in, in France. What about perhaps the, the S&P 200 trading in Australia? Um, are they offering international markets? And if you want to be in multiple markets, I think it's perhaps worth trying to find a broker who does rather than getting having to have multiple accounts at multiple different brokers. Remember one of the issues if you're going to want to move money from broker A to B, it's going to be a it's going to be a process. It's going to take time. It's going to cost you a fair bit of money in terms of fees and the like, uh, and it's not going to be a simple process as it certainly is. You know, if, if you've got everything in one place, the easy route, um, perhaps the easiest route. Some local brokers are enabling direct international investing. Uh, both online and offline, for example, Vestact, if you go to Vestact.com, uh, they are registered brokers in New York, so they can physically buy you shares in New York and you can deal with a bunch of guys who are sitting, I think they're in Hyde Park in Johannesburg. So nice and easy, uh, they will know what red tape you need, they will request what documents you need, uh, you're still going to need clearance certificates and the like, but certainly they will say, you know, this is the list of documents, bring it to us they will make it all happen. So they'll get rid of a lot of that space. And in the case of Vestact, they are advisory. They will say, we recommend these shares, those shares. Don't touch those ones. Of course, if you want to buy a share that's not on the advised list, they're absolutely going to let you do it. They're going to enable you to do it. Um, but they, they typically are advisory, but they offer that route. I don't know if they have uh, minimums. When I last chatted with Paul Theron, he said no. In truth, I was asking more about local and not about international. PSG um, online as well as iTrade from Sunlum, both have products which enable you to trade internationally. iTrade, if I recall, is using the Saxo Bank platform. Um, and if I also recall, I think that they, certainly one of them has a $10,000 minimum, that's iTrade, uh, $10,000 per transaction. So if you want to go and buy yourself some uh, BPs, they're going to say that's fine you've got about $10,000 worth. And that might be a little bit onerous for an individual. Maybe you weren't looking at $10,000. You were rather looking at 10,000 rand. So this is the easier route. It's perhaps a little less clean. Um, and certainly in terms of fees, it might be a little bit higher because you're not going directly to the, the online traders in, in, in international markets. Um, but in many cases, a whole lot easier in that process.
I had a list of international brokers and I'm just checking it has completely disappeared. Um, I will type them up. I'll quickly add a screen and, and, and we'll type them up. Um, the big ones, uh, Scott Trade, um, E-Trade, Schwab. Those are your US ones. Uh, E-Trade also in Australia and the UK. Um, the big one in the UK is E-Trade. And then uh, if you're looking particularly at the um, Australian market, it is Comsec is the big one in that space there if you're looking to get some exposure into the Australian markets. Saxo Bank, probably the biggest and most global of all of them. Um, they'll offer many derivatives. They'll also offer multiple markets that you can interact with. So Saxo Bank is the one that most folks go for. If you're going to the US exclusively, it's Charles Schwab, Australia, Comsec, and then uh, into the UK, it's typically E-Trade. But dig around, hit some chat forums, ask for people for advice. What is important is you're looking for an equity broker rather than a derivative broker. Uh, many people are going to mention IG Markets, sure, but really they're offering you derivative trading, spread trading, rather than uh, good old-fashioned just buying the shares on the underlying assets. Risks, I mean, there's a currency risk. Uh, I'm not going to delve into that in too much detail, but if the RAND goes still stronger, you're going to see losses in terms of RANDs, so there's always a currency risk. They're much bigger markets, and why is that a risk? Well, in the JSE, 400 shares, and that can be overwhelming. You go to the US, and there are thousands and thousands of shares, and that's both a risk and a benefit. You, you, you know, a, a lot more scope, a lot more ability to find stocks that no one else has found, where the market hasn't priced efficiently, but also a lot bigger in terms of just following news flows, following, following industry news, and the like. Uh, time zones. It shouldn't be such an issue. I mean, Australia is probably the worst time zone. They're typically eight or nine hours uh, behind us, um, sorry, ahead of us. The issue there, I suppose, more than anything, maybe, is, is you know, if, you, if you're comfortable placing a trade um, and saying, you know, buy me at this price and then leaving it, you would be typically placing trades when, when the market is closed. And unless in the case of Australia, uh, you're comfortable placing trades during odd hours. They sort of trade from late in the evening around 11 o'clock through to sort of 4 or 5 in the morning our time in South Africa. So time zones, uh, certainly something you need to take, be cognizant of, you need to check what's happening in that space there. Quick recap, many different ways to do it. Are some better than others? Short answer, no. They all have got their own pros and cons. You need to decide which works better for you. I like the ETS, but they only work if you want an entire market. You know, if you want the EU or if you want uh, uh, the UK, if you want to buy a particular stock, they obviously don't work. The IDX is very much more a trading process. Um, I Something like Vestac would work well for me, but you might physically want to go and open an account. As I said, there's some red tape, but the red tape's are one, and there's always red tape whenever there's money involved. Um, you can't remove that currency risk. You could hedge it up, but short answer, the currency risk is going to remain in place. And I know a lot of people who took money offshore in the early 2000s when the dollar was above 10 to the rand, and not only have their equities not done particularly well in the decade, decade or so since then, um, worse, the rand has strengthened. In fact, I know a lady who moved currencies. She paid 13.60 to the dollar, so she almost had a 50% loss in the currency, um, and her equities have gone. I think they've added about 5%. So that investment for her has been an absolute unremitting disaster. In short, though, it is easy. Um, as I said, the red tape and the like, but it is an easy process to do it. Certainly, it is available. It's going to get easier as time goes on. I think uh, in five or uh, ten years' time, we're going to be, lo be able to log on to our local online stockbroker, whoever it may be, and, and basically they're going to say, well, which market do you want to trade today? You know, pick a, pick a, you know, pick a country, pick a market, pick a share. Uh, we will get there. The, the big issue right now is exchange control regulations. When they, when they go, it's technology, but the technology is not really a, a hindrance. It's the stuff that needs to be implemented. Ladies and gents, that's the presentation. It really is a very, very simple process, not too complicated at all. Uh, if you've got any questions, you can um, raise your hand. I'll take you if you've got a microphone. Otherwise, put it in the text box. I see one from Christo. Uh, he's asking why investing fees are so much more in SA than the US. Oh, entirely off topic, but a good question nonetheless. Um, broadly, it is 
taxes and the like. And I'll give you an example. And I'm going to use Standard Bank because that's where I used to work. You buy 10,000 Rand worth of shares, uh, you pay 96 Rand, 0.96%. That's not bad. Um, where's that money going? Uh, 50 Rand goes to Standard Bank. Uh, 25 Rand goes on tax, 10 Rand and change goes on straight, um, and then of course there's VAT, which is about another 8 Rand. Of that 50 Rand Standard Bank gets, they still have to pay actual fees to the JSC. So of that 50 Rand, they might end up with only something in the region of uh, maybe as little as 10, unlikely, but not likely to be more than about 40 or 42 Rand. So that really is the issue, is that we've got uh, the brokerage fees have become seriously cheaper, but we haven't seen the other fees around it. The US, your transaction fees into exchanges and the like are very, very cheap. Ladies and gents, that seems to be all the questions. Thanks for your time this afternoon. Hope you had a great presentation. We'll see you next time. Thanks for coming. Cheers.